here and now, here we are, here we go. Okay, Steve, we've got a lot Hi. to talk about today. Hello. You've you've got some share screens that you've uh, discovered. Well, um, I don't have I don't have the share screen set up so it can work, and I, I don't want to mess up the program by showing some sloppy. But there's some things that I have run across this week that I thought I would share with some of our viewers. Um, I want to welcome everybody to the program, and please remember to like, to share, and subscribe to our YouTube program so you can know what's going on, and we can increase our numbers and have more people watch this program, okay? Um, one thing that I found very interesting was last week <clears throat> was the withdrawal of Brazil's ambassador to Israel. Um, Lula, President of Brazil, decided to sever all diplomatic relations with Israel. Uh, Brazil has expelled Israel's ambassador to Tel Aviv. He also recalled or asked his ambassador to Israel to come home. This was in response to the ongoing genocide in Gaza. Lula strongly criticized the Israeli government comparing its actions in Gaza to the Holocaust. And as a result of his, of his telling the truth, he was declared persona non grata by Israel. Um, news reports say that other world leaders have expressed solidarity with Lula, such as this Colombian President Gustavo, Gustavo Petro. Uh, he shared the need to uh, defend the truth and stop violence in Palestine. Russian President Vladimir Putin also emphasized humanity's duty to help the people of Gaza. As we know, South Africa currently has a case in the International Court of Justice against Israel for its actions, violent actions, and its, its denial of food, clothing, shelter for the Palestinians. So I thought the, the action of Lula and the Brazilian government were more than just uh, ceremony. They were extremely um, concrete, and I appreciate them. From what I've heard as well, <clears throat> I saw a video. Uh, perhaps I can uh, pull it up again. <clears throat> showing uh, the trucks waiting to cross over at the Beit Hanun, uh, crossing okay. there at Rafa. Okay. okay. You know, on the road, you know, as far as you could see, there was lines of, you know, transport trucks amounting to about 500 trucks. And only about 100 trucks have gotten in in the last, since, you know, Security Council said that, you know, aid should be allowed in. So, uh, and then there's big discussion of who's responsible for this, you know. Israel, the Zionist state, <clears throat> is charging that the... Uh, the aid is not getting in because of a lack of uh, coordination by uh, aid organizations. Meanwhile, you know, Israel is doing four security checks on top of the, uh, the Egyptian security check of all materials going, supposed to be going into Gaza. And somehow, you know, it's the, uh, the food is not getting in there. I have some uh, share screen showing, you know, one of the causes, you know, last week or two weeks ago, <clears throat> Uh, the uh, Zionist fanatics, you know, were there blocking the roadway and into the Beit Hanun crossing, and they're still doing it. And that's uh, evidently, you know, the first uh, and foremost reason why the aid is not getting in. I'll try to show this for you here now. Yeah, here it is. Yeah. So... Here's here's the genocide flag. Here's another one. And here's another one. No aid for the enemy. The enemy being all of the Palestinian people are supposed to be the enemy now. Which is truly bizarre. And in fact, they're uh, declaring themselves to be the enemy of the Palestinian people. So... It's like the inversion of what they are thinking. They have declared themselves to be an enemy of the Palestinian people, but the Palestinian people have not declared themselves to be an enemy of the Jewish Israelis. They're quite willing to live together with the Jewish Israelis 
judging from the Hamas proposal for mutual recognition as an independent state. I mean, even Hamas is calling for the recognition of a Palestine state uh, alongside of the Zionist state, not for the purposes of, of, of legitimatizing the Zionist state, but for the purposes of negotiating with the Zionist state in order to achieve the return of the Palestinian refugees. So what has uh, Zionism prepared for us here? This is how much the Jewish Israelis are indoctrinated to believe that Palestinians are the enemy. And presumably, you know, all Muslims and all Arabs are treated, you know, with the same prejudice here. Support for the transfer of aid, 30% amongst Jewish Israelis. 68% are opposed to the transfer of aid, including UNRWA, as explained here further on. And this is called the left left Jewish Israeli milieu and 40% oppose aid to Gaza. Hmm? And hmm. then the center is worse and then the right wing. Wow. 20% of the right wing, you know, like don't want to murder all the Palestinians. How nice of them. Okay. So. Well, Abraham, wait, Abraham, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Uh, let's, let's, let's look at these numbers here. We have 80, 51, 39, that's uh, 190 plus 68, that's 258 plus 13, that's 270 divided by 5. So we're looking at at least 60% in average of all the categories su support cutting off aid. Incredible. Yeah, yeah. Even amongst yeah, yeah. the uh, Arab Israelis, yeah, yeah, the Palestinian yeah. Israelis, 13% yeah. want to cut off all aid. Uh, I mean, you know, like they're brainwashed. Even, Come on, they're even brainwashed. they're brainwashed. Yeah, this is how much do they? They brainwash and they, they support the oppression of their own people. Yes, they're called. And the reason why they're brainwashed is because they can only go to, uh, you know, uh, Zionist schools. That's all. Exactly. 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 Yeah. Exactly. Incredible. Okay, now here. This here is a video of what they're doing at the crossing. Well, um, I'm, I'm going to intervene here, um, Abraham. You know, as I understand it, if this is a property of Israel, the territory of Israel, and I think it is, the Israeli military or police can arrest those people and right. can let the folks in. And yeah. I, I'm, I'm, gonna be, I'm just gonna cut to the chase. Yeah. These, uh, these, these so-called protesters, these Israeli citizens who support the apartheid rule over the people of Gaza and the West Bank, they can be, I'm not advocating it, but they can be arrested. Hmm. Well, they are they are impeding hmm. a, an internationally agreed upon transfer of aid hmm. from the international community through hmm. this cross point in the Gaza. They can mm -hmm. be arrested. They can be cited. They can mm -hmm. be even just um um kind of, They can be corralled into an area to let this mm -hmm. occur. Mm -hmm. This happens only with the collaboration of the Zionist state uh, leadership. Mm -hmm. that's only, that's yeah. always, they, we can't say, oh, they're protesting. We can do it by no. If you and I protest somewhere, the police can move us. We won't like it. Mm -hmm. We will, we may resist it. We may not resist it, but they can remove us. Yes, they can. Yeah. Here, I'll show you this uh, brief 24-second video again, because there's an important point in which the soldier is talking with the driver of the transport. You can tell by his hand gesture, you know, that what he's saying is lo. Lo means no in Hebrew. At least I know one word of Hebrew. And, uh, you know, he's telling the truck, you know, to, to get lost, you know, that he's not allowed to cross over. This is a soldier. Just one soldier alone, you know, is, is stopping the transport from coming in. And they have this, you know, like unlimited, you know, impunity 
for right wing soldiers who can do whatever they want. You know, I remember going to visit, you know, uh, Comrade Ahmed uh, one time, and we're going to uh, driving along the highway after I met him on the green line. And then we come to this checkpoint, you know, where there's one soldier, you know, standing there, you know, and he makes a checkpoint and he says, we can't go, you know, back to Nablus. And, uh, you know, I, and, and Ahmed says, that's where I live, you know, and he says, and the soldier says, go back, you know, he says, yes, I am going back, you know, home, going back home. And the soldier wouldn't listen to him and he wouldn't let him through, you know, and then uh, he asked to speak to me, you know, and I, you know, like make it clear, you know, that I'm Jewish. And from Canada. And the guy turns out to be a Canadian from London, Ontario, who apologized to me and then let us through. You know, these soldiers, you know, have unlimited power and they think the whole country belongs to them as an individual. And that's the way they talk. It's the most incredible phenomenon. Wow. So he apologized to you for the racism yeah. he was yeah. and bigotry and discrimination he was showing to all Palestinians. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. And, and that slogan, I'm Yisrael Chai, the Zionists, you know, at the vigil, when they, when they want to sort of, you know, uh, uh, chant, uh, you know, will drive by and they shout, you know, like, I'm Yisrael Chai. And then I reply when I get a chance. In Hebrew, I learned this, you know, from Comrade Net and Phoenix, you know, Hamadinat, the state, vi lo Yisrael. The state is not Israel. Why? Because Israel was initially the name of the Jewish people as a whole, irrespective of territory, as being, you know, uh, a progenity, you know, of the descendants, you know, of uh, of Isaac uh, and uh, it, it doesn't mean the state. You know, at one point uh, there was, you know, mass, uh, a popular demand, you know, to be a nation like other nations in which, you know, the Israelites wanted to have a king. So Samuel, you know, the prophet said, you know, like, you don't really want to have a king, you know, because a king means taxes and going to war, da 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 da, -da. But they wouldn't listen to him, you know. So uh, I quoted this in a printout that I ha was handing out to the uh, Jewish people going into the Jewish community campus, you know, to the Holocaust Museum or daycare or, or the library. And the security guard came out under orders from the administration that I wasn't allowed to hand out this leaflet <laughs> to, to people wow, going into wow, the Jewish wow, community. Wow, wow. You know, like it's incredible, you know, dictatorial, you know, practice that has been instituted for decades and decades. And I'm breaking it all up. So, okay, now, oh, wow, wow. there is, a, there is a, a strategy that was proposed actually by my son, Saley, you know, that this whole thing, this whole mania, this whole hysteria is based upon the horror stories that were propagated, you know, about October the 7th. And as uh, I've gone through in other videos, especially with Ahmad, you know, the claim now, well, the military started off, you know, claiming that 1,400 Israeli civilians were killed on October the 7th in a mass murder campaign by Hamas uh, fighters, so-called terrorists. Okay, then they changed it to 1,200 because 200 of the bodies that were incinerated by tank fire were found to be Hamas fighters. And the reason being that uh, these were the Hamas fighters that were holding hostages and they were all obliterated by tank fire uh, in order to get rid of the Hamas fighters and they couldn't care less about the Israeli hostages, even though that was supposed to be their primary objective to liberate them. This hypocrisy was uh, revealed, and they had to admit that 200 of the of the bodies that they counted as civilians were not Israelis, and they were actually, you know, Hamas fighters. So the number went down to 1,200. Then, for some reason, the number went down to 1,139. And they left the implication that these were all civilians, but they didn't take into account that 325 of those bodies were actually uh, Zionist soldiers. Uh, the whole uh, Gaza brigade, you know, was obliterated. These were the soldiers, if we remember, were the ones who were sniping all the uh, Palestinian civilian protesters who were coming on the great march of return to the frontier of Gaza a couple of years ago, and they were all shot down 
the number of shot down was about 323. And ironically, the number of us, Israeli soldiers who were who were killed in battle is 363, uh, uh, I think it is. Now, the number of Hamas fighters that were killed in that battle, and that's what it was on October the 7th, was 200. So that's 363 uh, against 200. And the 200 were killed, you know, by by unlawful means. So a tremendous victory for the Hamas fighters on October the 7th. And it was not a campaign of um, murder. It was a campaign of liberation, eruption from a ghetto that is being turned into a concentration camp of death, a death camp. And they were rather successful and showed the total um, arrogance of the uh, Zionist military, which assumed that the Palestinians had been tamed into docility and were being treated like animals in a cage, and that the animals would never sort of revolt, you know, because they wouldn't know how, but they knew how on land, sea, and from the air. <laughs> from the air, yes, brother. From the wow. air. You know, like yep. what an invention that was, you know. From the air. They couldn't believe it, I'll tell you, man. And then the coincidence of this, uh, you know, uh, rave festival that was happening and this, that was moved at the last minute into that area right in front of the military base, which was the objective of the air assault, you know, under these gliders, you know, with sometimes even two occupants to a glider, you know, coming in, you know, with their with their homemade, you know, machine guns. <laughs> this is incredible. This is historic. And uh, uh, it shows it that... Uh, yeah, you know, like somebody said, you know, like resistance always wins and repression never does over time. You know, it's inevitable. Hmm. I I think that the uh, especially when I saw the when I saw the air the uh the the air the uh, uh air campaign uh, and I'm gonna call it the air campaign led by the Palestinian uh, resistance fighters. It just reminded me of the um, slave revolts. Uh, the most the most successful one was the one in Haiti, in which Toussaint Louverture led the Haitian people to defeat the French, established the first free Black Republic uh, outside of Africa, uh, in in all uh, the world, and no one that's to this day still condemned in the way that Haiti is still treated by the United States and the West. They still have that condemnation hundreds of years after that that revolt. So the Palestinians are joining this great history of slave and oppressed people's uh, resistance. And they're always called murderers. They're always called killers. They're always called savages mm. by those who actually are the murderers and the mm. savages and the killers. Mm. And I appreciate you you're sharing the information about what really happened. I do think we need to go back and, and clear this up. Yeah. Straight this is uh... That's very important. Really yes, uh -huh. uh, there there is another revolt happening in Haiti right now as well as well as uh, Senegal are the current uh, ongoing revolts. But in Haiti, I read something of the revolt, the history of the revolt. You know, initially there, which was the first revolutionary force, the first fighting force that defeated Napoleon. This was Napoleon's France, you know, that was occupying yeah. Haiti, oh, yeah. Haiti at the time. So, oh, yeah. you know, and they, but they don't mention that. You know, they say, oh well, you know, Napoleon was. Finally, you know, you know, stopped at Accra, you know, in uh, in Palestine, in Canaan, but they don't mention Haiti had defeated the French forces there. What yeah. happened during that campaign when the French forces were genociding the population? Because you know, if the pa population was was you know revolutionary, then the task, you know, as far as they were concerned, was to kill off all the revolutionaries. So the French forces had a mercenary force from Poland there. The Polish mercenaries, when they saw the population being genocided, revolted against the French military forces and joined the revolution against the French forces and helped to defeat the French forces. And there's a wow. village there, and the, and the Polish, you know, like mercenaries, they settled down there, got married and had kids, and those kids, mulattoes, are still living there in their own village, you know, in Haiti. <laughs> now... This is oh, what can turn people around. I know this. Did not know this. Yeah, it's a, it's a nice, you know, like uh, inside story, you know, of that revolution. It's beautiful. Now, those, you know, uh, Polish mercenaries, you know, were turned around when they saw the genocide happening. 
the same thing can happen, you know, with the Jewish Israelis. You know, if they were taught, and if the their supporters amongst, you know, the Montreal conservative Jewish community are, are taught that the lies that they've been told were merely lies by politicians to secure their support for a genocidal campaign against the Palestinians because they want to expel them into Egypt, take over the territory, take over the gas fields offshore, and build a canal to the Red Sea, you know, right through the middle of Gaza. And they want to expel the Palestinians into Egypt to do so. And they're willing to use genocidal, you know, measures in order to uh, force the Palestinians to flee into Egypt. And this is what, you know, has been lined up to have to happen. The, uh, the military says, oh, well, they could always go back to the destroyed, uh, you know, parts of Gaza in the north. But, <laughs> you know, I'm, you know, there's nothing to go back to. And if they did try to go back there, they'd probably be bombed in any case, because they're just bombing any conglomeration of Palestinian civilians that they can get a hold of because they're running out of targets. So the idea is that uh, Saley came up with which Ahmed considered to be a brilliant idea, is that they should be sued for defamation because defamation is that they're lying with the serious consequences. They were lying about me too. You know, they, you know, when they first had me arrested, they called up the uh, hate crimes division of the police. So there's an action that I can legitimately assume uh, of defamation and I can sue them for defamation because they're accusing me of being anti-Semitic, which I'm not, and I can prove it. I can prove that they're the ones, you know, playing footsie with the anti-Semites of the Protestant evangelical movement uh, in the United States with Hagi, who are all basically anti-Jewish because they want to see all the Jewish people leave and go to Palestine. And those who don't, you know, they're quite willing to kill. So this defamation suit is uh, uh, becoming an, an essential sort of, you know, measure to open up another front to demonstrate that they have no proof of the allegations of the horror stories that they claim took place on October the 7th. And the Hamas fighters were not guilty of mass rapes of hundreds, so-called. They were not guilty of uh, beheading and burning 40 uh, Israeli babies, uh, which even the Israel government, you know, has dropped as a claim. Uh, and they're not uh, and uh, guilty of killing civilians per se. Uh, where uh, uh, civilians uh, were killed, they were likely in uh, open fire. They took, you know, there were reserve soldiers in, uh, in their homes, uh, certainly, but reserve soldiers who had their arms and they were shooting on Hamas fighters. And so they got shot back at and they lost. So of the uh, remaining uh, 1,139 minus 323 uh, soldiers of those remaining, the question is how many were killed by uh, Zionist military fire? Uh, and the answer is uh, probably the majority because, you know, the objective, the strategic objective of Hamas was to take hostages so that they could get the release of the Palestinian prisoners who numbered 5,000 at the time. Now the number of Palestinian prisoners number, numbers more than 10,000 since October the 7th. More than uh, 5,000 have been taken into detention and held as hostages for any further negotiations. You know, this is the way they play the game. So the th uh, I'm going to speak to the lawyer, Maître uh, Richard Beaulieu James, movement lawyer, great guy, got me out of prison. And we're going to see if how we can proceed, you know, with a, a suit for defamation and make this into an offensive and not just a defensive campaign that we're undergoing here now. Well, uh, I want I want to um, comment on this, Abraham, because I find that sometimes our allies in battle don't um, don't appreciate the uh, utility of the legal argument. Let me give you an example. This is Black History Month in the United States, and there were over 30 to 40 members of the Black Panther Party murdered by police during the party's existence. Hundreds were also jailed and imprisoned, and some are still in prison. And this is, uh, let's say, 40 years after the Panthers uh, ceased to exist. Like uh, Mumia al Jabbar, Like Mumia, exactly. And I have said 
the state of the U.S. is so deplorable that no one has even, to my knowledge, and I don't know everything, so maybe it has been considered, filing a number of lawsuits challenging all of the imprisonments because how could there have been a legal case against these young men? They were all young men. All of them were young black men. If there was a campaign of extermination, harassment carried out by the FBI, the IRS, the CIA against them. A legal case could be made that all of them must immediately be released and given reparations for the time in jail. All of the all of the all of the still living members should be given reparations for the legal and harassment they suffered by the FBI and police departments. And I was rebuked. Oh, you can't talk about that. Who gonna sue that? Yeah, yeah, was it? No, you have to sometime hmm. make the argument that you have rights that are violated by your enemy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You have to have the courage to at least make the argument. Because my argument is all of the convictions are tainted, not because of evidence, but because they were targeted by the government. Therefore, mm -hmm. their rights were violated. Mm -hmm. Yes. If yes. You're right. If you're targeted by the government, your <laughs> rights are violated. And if and the imprisonments are a result of being targeted. Yeah. Yeah, this came uh, up in uh, 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 in my court uh, case, you know, when I was uh, still in prison and I came before the judge <clears throat> with um, Maître Beaulieu. And uh, I said to the, you know, the judge said that um, I, I consider your case to have merit because you were following the legal procedure. You were trying to get the police condition revoked before you went back and you were yeah. uh, charged with right. breach of condition. But you tried to get it revoked on a correct legal basis, and it was an error of the judge, admitted by the judge, that the that condition could have been overturned by the judge, because it was merely a police condition. The police are part of the state, okay, an arm of the state. Right. Court is not an arm of the state. The court is an arm of civil society, as opposed to the state. And so civil society and the court can overrule the state. That is, civil society can elect a government that can change, you know, the state. And in court, civil society can make a, a case for uh, liberation from prison, even though the police had, you know, uh, asked for, had required me to be in prison because of their condition. The court overruled the police condition because the court is more powerful than the police. And I was liberated. And I said to the to the judge, yes, I agree that the court is part of civil society and not the state, and that it can overrule the police condition. And the, and the judge agreed, overruled the police condition, made a long written statement that I recorded and I've transcribed and put up on um, academia.edu. And the next day I walked out of there prison. You you know, otherwise I wouldn't have been in prison, you know, like maybe even until now, because, you know, my next court date is uh, March the 3rd. I could have been yeah, in prison. I mean, until... that, that's what I'm saying. Like in your situation, you were incarcerated. You were, you know, in the court system. You had no other, you had no other, re that's the only recompense you have beside a rebellion to break you out of jail. That's the only, that's the only and that's usually not the, the first option that we have. Yeah. First all we have is to go to court. That's kind of how it goes. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's, all, that's all I'm saying. You know. So I'm saying those of us outside, of, outside of jail and inside of jail should not. We should learn from South Africa. Mm. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. It's a tactic. They can ignore it, but it's still a tactic we can use. Yeah. And I do but a super tactic, like a strategy. Right. It's, it's part of a strategy. It's a tactic in our strategy to to, to obtain liberation. Yeah, yeah. In fact, you know, I broke out of prison legally. <laughs> there you go. Legally, le legally left, you know? Yeah, and legally left. And sometimes that may be the best way to try and get out. The other yeah. way, you might not make it. I'm just saying. Yeah. But that's all. Yeah. And, if I, and I also want to make a comment, too. You know, um, one thing I want to talk about is the 
use of the Israeli citizens as prisoners held by Hamas and the Palestinian fighters. I see nothing wrong with it. As a matter of fact, I learned, if this is true, maybe you can help me with this, through a, reading a Times of Israel article that the Palestinian fighters were working and have been getting medicine to those prisoners because they didn't know who, who they were who they were seizing and the medical conditions. Mm. And they've been trying to aid in the humanitarian aid to the to their to their captives by getting the medical aid. Mm. I find it to be quite um 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 benevolent of them. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I, I don't know if the Times of, Israel, Times of Israel article was true, but it would make sense if I'm holding you prisoner and I want you to live, mm. and if you have a medical condition, which I can have someone diagnosed to be true, mm. then I'll get you medicine. Yeah. Make sure but the last it. two hostages, Steve, the last two hostages that were released, they didn't use and they complaining that they hadn't received their medication. But that was before the Security Council resolution ordering Israel to allow medication and food into the Gaza. And because Hamas couldn't give them medication if they didn't have any medication in the right. first place. Right. Right. So, you know, so they didn't know that the Security Council had ordered the medication into the Gaza. And, they, and the hostages finally got the medication, despite right. the fact that 31 were killed by Zionist bombings as well, you know, which is admitted to by the, right. by the government there. The reason why I'm making this point, Abraham, is I want to I want to push back on this narrative because it is the narrative of the oppressor to always call the oppressed a savage, mm -hmm. to always say the oppressed have no humanity, that they're mm -hmm. ignorant, they're bloodthirsty. They mm -hmm. always use rape against the men. The charge that we are all, all we want to do is rape women. We just want to rape everybody while we're just lusting for sex. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a trope that's used against oppressed men all over the world mm. throughout history, probably. Mm -hmm. And the fact that these Palestinian freedom fighters had compassion, understood the need to keep their prisoners alive, mm. to give them medicine, is to me a testament to their humanity, not to their savagery. Mm. I'm convinced that I have to file a suit for defamation because that will force them to try to prove all of their allegations and they won't be able to in court. There you and, go. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, so we're coming to an end of our allotted time and uh, attention span and what people have to do to get out to demonstrations and such. Yes, yes, yes. There, so there are, uh, there the vigil continues life. tomorrow. And uh, the Zionists are still very upset, you know, that uh, the, our Jewish Bund vigil is taking place there. Very upset. Last okay. week, there was a, even a Christian that came up and, and was shouting at me. And there was re and I didn't get it on uh, tape, uh, on the video, but uh, only her sort of uh, shouting. And then I told her to, you know, just leave, you know, because I didn't want to speak with her, you know. And then she attacked the banner. And the uh, painting, you know, uh, one Holocaust does not justify another. But they weren't damaged this time. And then she just went off, called her a fascist, and announced, you know, that I was going to fight anybody who tries to touch the banner and, and damage it. And two, two previous times it was damaged, and I've repaired it. And it's now solid, and we continue tomorrow then. Okay. Okay, bro. That's Great to speak good, with you. All right. Really encouraging. Thank you. Make sure, make sure everybody likes, subscribe, and share. Press those mm -hmm. buttons. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You know, we need people to get uh, aware of these issues that we're raising. And it's not just, you right. know, for those who are already aware. You know, we have to get this out, you know, into the general public. So please share this video everywhere.